Well, good evening, folks. Uh, this is the period of time where I'm going to give a little bit of an update as our uh, social media platforms populate. And then uh, I'm going to share with you uh, the two great guests we have on tonight. Uh, I'll give you an update on the SOS letter campaign and uh, some other issues that are certainly uh, affecting the United States of America as well as uh, Canada. Uh, but here's something interesting that just came across my desk uh, before we uh, get started with our regular broadcast. Um, Justin Trudeau, think, listen to this one, folks. Justin Trudeau has contacted Joe Biden. Uh, for what reason? Well, Justin Trudeau says he needs help in fighting the number one national security problem for the United States, as well as Canada. And that problem is not communist China. That problem is wind, rain, smoke. The problem is climate. So Justin Trudeau believes that uh, he needs the help of the United States to fight uh, climate uh, issues, to, to, to make some climate change uh, as an issue. But uh, what Justin Trudeau needs to understand, and I hope some of his uh, colleagues are watching, uh, there is going to be a climate change here in Washington, D.C. sooner rather than later, uh, because Joe Biden is on his way out. Uh, what the DOG and FBI released today was absolutely um, shocking. Even I was shocked. Uh, there appears to be, and I'm going to use the word appears to be, enough evidence to prove that Joe Biden was, in fact, in a, uh, a very large bribery scheme. Uh, while he was uh, vice president and maybe, this maybe, while he was uh, first inaugurated into office. Now, of course, uh, we haven't seen all of the documents, but they're going to be released soon. Uh, but even the Democrat Party is now scratching their heads, at least publicly scratching their heads saying, poor Joe. But the Democrat Party is actually thanking the good Lord that Joe uh, uh, will be able to get ushered out of office so they could put somebody in who they think can beat the Republican. Well, that's not going to happen. The only guy we have to worry about as far as the Republican Party is concerned is the uh, trajectory of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And I said that a long time ago. You get a, a, a Kennedy type um, uh, candidate, and I'm talking about uh, one who will represent the Democrat Party of John F. Kennedy and FDR and Robert F. Kennedy. Well, as Republicans, we're going to have a real problem on our hands, which leads me to this for my American audience. Uh, I've been tweeting out and I'm going to release a statement Monday on video as to as to, to address the uh, political suicide that is being committed by the Republican Party of the United States. Now, I won't get into too many details tonight because we don't have that much time. I want you to hear our guests. But if the Republican Party of the United States of America doesn't knock it off, and I mean the name calling, the denigration of candidates, uh, you know, we're supposed to be the party that has a big tent and we're going to invite everybody in and we're going to be talking. I'm talking about Republican conservative folks. Uh, we're going to work together. Well, there's been anything but that. Uh, so on Monday, uh, I'm going to release something that uh, probably is not going to sit well with a lot of Republicans, whether they're establishment or not. But somebody's got to step up. Somebody's got to say, look, you better knock it off for the good of the country. We better knock it off. So uh, I'll be releasing that Monday. Also on Monday or Tuesday, uh, and I'm going to give a little bit of this to you later on between our guests, between I introduce Joe Connor, who's the American guest. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you an update on the SOS letters, and I'm going to answer the question of why we are really involved in this. There is a reason why Campaign for America is urging American citizens to step up and to help the Canadian citizens. Uh, people have been asking me why. We don't understand. How is it that you're so deeply committed to this? Well, I'm going to give you the answer tonight, folks because we're going to give it next week anyway in a uh, press release that we're going to send out. And hopefully the media will pick up and then roll with it. In the meantime, we're going to do the best we could to uh, bring truth and transparency and facts to the uh, people, not only in the United States and Canada, but around the world. Which leads me to uh, our first guest is Ken Drysdale. Now, now I got to tell you, I've met Ken uh, uh, over the Internet. I, I'd love to meet him personally. Uh, his wife is a great singer. Uh, him and his wife are really committed to uh, working very hard to make sure that Canada's freedom, liberty, and individual rights of the people are preserved. He's one of those guys on the front line who certainly, uh, I, I tell you, he went above and beyond with this uh, National Citizens Inquiry. 
So I'm going to bring Ken on, and, and Ken, I'm going to ask him. Let me get him on here, folks. Okay. Hello, Ken. How are you? Good evening. I'm great. How are you? Uh, well, Ken, I will tell you, nothing blew up here. <laughs> so, <laughs> folks, I was telling Ken before we went on the air, you know, we're really in desperate need of new software and stuff. And we did some things today, all right? Our team did some things today. And everything is working fine. I'm thinking, but nobody checked what would happen if we went live. <laughs> so I told Ken, if we blow up, that's the way it is. But we're here. We're here. So, Ken, uh, to begin with, for the sake of our American audience and audiences around the world, uh, because the Canadians know you well, uh, would you please share with us what the National Citizens Inquiry is and what you did? Because what you did was brilliant, man, I'll tell you. And I want to use that as a model at some point for the American citizens to do exactly what you did. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Drysdale. Ken. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, National Citizens Inquiry was an investigation by citizens into the actions of our governments on all levels, uh, federal, uh, state, uh, municipal governments and, and what they did during the pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic. So it's a, it's a group mostly of volunteers. There's a handful of people that have uh, are get nominal uh, salary paid. The rest of them are volunteers, and I believe there's hundreds, if not thousands, of them across the country. Um, we are uh, supported by donations from ordinary Canadians. We don't have any large uh, donors. We have no government money. We have no big corporation, no big donors there. So we're the people we're beholden to are the Canadian people. And so what we did was we put together two things. We put together a commission which administers our activities. And then independent of the commission, we appointed four commissioners. And we take um, and we held hearings in eight cities from coast to coast in Canada. In each city, we spent three days um, with witnesses um, that spanned the gamut uh, from experts to ordinary people, uh, 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 just like you and I. And we, uh, over the course of those 24 days of testimony, we had 325 Canadians testify. We had 94 experts. Uh, we have a, a petition going right now and what's going to a whole people always ask me, well, what comes out of this? And the first thing that's coming out of this is that millions and millions of people, both in Canada, the United States and around the world are watching these testimonies and they're riveting. You know, we have we have uh, experts like Dr. Malone. We've got experts like um Oh, I'm just going to bring them up here. Uh, there's actually a list on the website that we've have. We've had um, uh, Dr. Trotsy on there. We've had, oh gosh, just about everyone who uh, has been playing a role in bringing the truth out to the world testified. And in addition to that, that, that group of world-renowned experts, we had ordinary folks. You know, we had doctors who lost their jobs testified that they lost their jobs because they were reporting adverse reactions. We had um, housewives on there whose uh, parent or their their sister or their co-worker died uh, because of alleged vaccine injuries. We had people that were denied medical service because they were unvaccinated testifying. We had people testifying that they lost their jobs, soldiers, pilots, doctors, nurses, paramedics, railway workers it's it's amazing uh, what, what testimonies come out so the intent of this thing was first to provide this information to canadians and to world and it's archived it's on our website the national citizen inquiry.ca you can go there you can watch the the um the testimonies they were broadcast live when they were going on so we've created an archive which is completely accessible by anybody for free. You can download it, you can look, watch it, you can, you can keep it, you can send it to somebody. So we created an archive. We've, we're educating people. And right now the four commissioners, uh, including myself, are working on a final report and recommendations document. And uh, <laughs> uh, we're, we're targeting that we're gonna, the commissioners are gonna have a good part, if not all of their work done by the end of June. And then, as you know, that's kind of the beginning of, uh, 
of, uh, you know, making sure, you know, editing it, translating into different languages and getting it out. So I'm not quite sure when it's going to hit the public, but when it does, it will be available to anybody for free. Ken, did you find in the beginning that, I'll tell you, uh, what you're describing to me is very courageous people. I mean, uh, with all the bullying and intimidation and threats coming from the government, uh, the courageous uh, people that stepped up and were willing to testify publicly, did you find in the beginning it was difficult to convince anybody that uh, you guys were on the up and up and you were really looking to do uh, what would be good for the people? Or were people just stepping up saying, I'm done with it, let's do what we got to do? You know, that's a great question. We had a really mixed bag. You know, we we um, we not all, we had witnesses who stood up and some people incredibly bravely stood up. You know, we had a, a retired judge who testified. We had experts on constitutional law. We had people that were working, you know, supporting a family and were under threat that they were going to lose their jobs if they spoke up. I mean, people here are still hurting from the fact that the federal government uh, uh, froze people's bank accounts. And there's still people in this country who have their bank accounts frozen without being convicted of a crime uh, in Canada. And they're in jail, by the way. Uh, there's a number of people in Hoots, Alberta, who are still in jail. Uh, not convicted of a crime yet, by mind you. But uh, so there's a, there was a lot of fear and there has been a lot of retribution against people. You know, it was this fear was so deep that even the venues, like we would... We would uh, rent a venue in such and such a city and we would be prepared to go into there and then we would get notice from them two or three, four days ahead of the hearing, ah, oh, they're out, you can't have, their, can't have their venue. So we'd be scrambling on a number of instances to get alternative venues, you know, days or a week before the event. You know, we had, as you know, in the testimonies, what we did was we, we, um, we uh, every witness was sworn in or promised to to tell the truth the whole truth nothing but the truth and they were cross-examined by lawyers um in some cities we had difficulty getting lawyers who were willing to stand up and do this um we had witnesses that you know were afraid of their jobs were afraid of all you know retribution and they dropped out at the last minute so we were one of the things that happened was we were scheduling witnesses but we would schedule a number of extra witnesses just in case somebody dropped out and then they wouldn't drop out and then we'd be going till 8 38 45 at night <laughs> so it and was they, stood. Uh, they actually stood yeah yeah it, it's incredible and the courage of some of these and the stories that we heard you, you know you have no idea what happened out there you know we think we do but you know we listen to about 250 hours or 250, 300 hours of testimony from folks. And it was heartbreaking. You know, some of the stories, I mean, you know. Ken, we're, we're going to uh, start to uh, play those videos. You know, we're going to get some of your inquiry testimony. And the American people need to see for themselves. You know, what you did was so significant because it's not supposition. It's not your opinion, my opinion. Well, she said this, he said that. We're not. There's no room for for a misinterpretation when it comes out of the mouths of those who were truly affected by this. Yeah. It must have been really uh, heartbreaking, also, for you to sit there uh, and hear story after story. And and I'm going to ask you this question because um, uh, uh, people need to know what was going through your mind and the mind of the other courageous people on your commission. It must have been frustrating to hear all of this and feel powerless. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, it ends up that it's becoming very powerful. Oh, absolutely. You know, and and uh, all of the testimonies, I said, it's it's available on the National Citizens Query website. It's on Rumble. Not so much on YouTube. We got um, banned on YouTube uh, after a day or two. Believe it or not, we got shadow banned on Twitter. So I don't know. They were trying to get a message to Elon Musk about that. But I don't know. I don't know that that ever happened. What it was is we were on Twitter. But if you did a search for National Citizen Inquiry, it didn't come up with anything. We got kicked off of TikTok and we got banned, I believe, in, on Facebook in the end. We were live streaming to all those platforms. Um, you know, the other thing that we're doing is we're 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 uh, taking those 
10, 11, 12 hour days and we're cutting the video up into into pieces so that you can you can watch just a particular witness. And that's all available right now on Rumble, um, National Citizens Inquiry on Rumble. But in our, on our website, we will have those all professionally done. We have a video, an audio video team, and those will be available in their entirety in the, in the coming weeks or so. So, but they're, they're available right now on Rumble. And we're also, by the way, we're preparing full transcripts of all of the testimony. And you can imagine that, <laughs> what an exercise that is. And we're translating it into uh, the two official languages in Canada, English and French, by the way. Ken, we got a bit of uh, good news this week, surprising news, but nonetheless good. Uh, we learned that there are some U.S. media outlets watching this broadcast. Uh, there are some reporters uh, uh, that have been watching us. And actually, uh, I've been invited a couple of times to go on and to speak about uh, the issues that are happening in Canada. But what I want to do is get you on uh, and get some people right from Canada on those broadcasts. So those reporters uh, who are watching, uh, please get in touch with me and, and I'll get you in touch with uh, Kenyon. You need to hear it right from uh, the mouths of those who have worked so hard on the front lines in Canada. Yeah. And, and, and Ken, the, the, the issues that uh, you've been involved in, uh, I, you know, with, with the Canadian people are not being told is that they're succeeding. I mean, for you to pull this off uh, 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 with all the opposition from power, if you will, uh, shows me one thing. And, and I hope and, and pray that the Canadian people understand what I'm about to say. I know the American people will understand it because we've been through that and we now are pretty much in control of our government. But the Canadian people need to understand that the government of Justin Trudeau and his supporters fear you. They are scared to death of you. And this is why they're passing these laws like C-11 and, and, and they were threatening and intimidating witnesses to go before the civilian inquiry. That happened here in America and they learned real quick that uh, the tide would turn and it is turning now. So Ken, I think it's important for people to understand uh, out of the work you've done and others have done and continue to do uh, that you've touched the world. I I've got to tell you, I've gotten letters from people. In fact, on this broadcast right now, I'm following the feeds. We've got people from Australia watching. Uh, somebody, I think, from New, New, New Zealand popped up. So people are very, very uh, curious as to what you did and how you did it. Uh, so the next question is, where do you go from here? Uh, you've got all this testimony, all this uh, first-person evidence. Where do you go from here? Well, you know, the immediate uh, uh, task at hand right now is to is to get this report done. It's it's going to be a it's a massive undertaking. You can imagine um, it's um, and in addition to that, the commission itself is starting to plan what next steps might happen in the future. And I'm not privy to what those decisions have been so far because I'm an independent commissioner and I'm not supposed to be influenced by any internal workings at the commission. So my focus right now is the report, but I can, I can assure your audience in Canada and United States that, that the commission will continue. I know they're planning some big events. There will be a big event when the report is released and it will be released worldwide and you can get it for free off of our website. You can download it, you can own your copy of it. This cannot be flushed down the memory hole. You know, if millions of people uh, uh, download this thing and they have a permanent record of it, it can't be taken away from them. And that's extremely important. Ken, I just got a good morning from Saipan. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, my friend from Saipan, it's uh, morning there, but it's oh. getting later. <laughs> it would be, thanks, uh... thanks for joining us from Saipan. Ken, uh, we here at Campaign for America, we're the only broadcasting network, live streaming or otherwise in the United States that have taken up this cause for the Canadian people and also for us. But um, we have to work closely within the framework of our laws with regard to how we approach these issues, uh, because we do have laws that prohibit us from directly uh, getting involved in influencing your government. OK, uh, that is your leaders. But what we can do and we have done is educate our leaders, uh, whether it be a meeting with congressional representatives or with the SOS letters, I, I tell you, we're going to somehow, some way, when we get the number of letters we want, uh, we're going to bring them right to the U.S. Congress. Representatives and talk with them 
And maybe by the time we're ready to do that, your report will be done because I want to bring that with us. Now, now saying that, uh, once it's in their hands, uh, I would guess they're going to be stunned. They're going to be shocked because the fact is this, and this is why we're involved, and I'll talk a little bit about this later after you and I uh, finish our interview. Uh, everything going on in Canada, including what you unearth, what you discovered, is, at least in our view, a direct national security threat to the United States of America. Because I believe everything that's going on in Canada was attempted here in the United States under Biden and his uh, uh, supporters as governors, etc., and it failed here. But when you follow the money or follow the political power structure, it leads back, at least to us, the Communist Chinese Party. It leads back to the influence of the CCP, uh, their policies, their laws to enslave people. Now, I'm not talking about folks, slave, slavery with chains and irons. Who knows? I mean, I hope to God it never comes to that. Economic slavery, medical slavery. You do what you're told because the government tells you what's right. You have no uh, say in it. But by you unearthing what you did, uh, I've got to tell you, it, 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 it pretty much, at least in my view, confirms that there was a real effort uh, to enslave people one way or the other. If not physically, how about psychologically? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we, we had witnesses testify, expert witnesses testify, that by the end of March in 2020, they knew. They knew what was going on. The government knew, but they continued to push their policies, their lockdowns, their mandates. But the data was there according to our ex according to testimony that we received. Um, you know, I, I can't discuss... Uh, conclusions that we will have in the report until they're done. It's kind of like a judge commenting during a trial as to what they're thinking. But I can talk about some of the testimony we had. And it's it's compelling that it was very, very early on that the government in Canada and and very likely the United States knew exactly what was going on. Oh, I, I've got to tell you, what uh, pleasantly surprises me now is as my wife and I and our team get around, uh, they ask us, well, what have you guys been up to? We, we, we know you're you know, jumping around the country and you're, you're helping the Republican Party and candidates get elected. Uh, you're doing anything else? And I said, well, we're working pretty hard to help the Canadian people. And you know what, Ken? They know about it. <laughs> they oh, know. yeah. They're telling me. Oh, yeah. I get comments like that at Trudeau. And I'm not going to use the language they use, but they did. And, and, and the people in Canada are really under a, an iron fist there. And, and these Americans are very well aware. The problem that we're overcoming because we're involved with this with other American people is leadership. Uh, we need leaders to understand this more than anything else because they could be in a position uh, to take some sort of action politically. Yes. Uh, but the power is in our hands. This is why we've asked for letters. This is why we've asked for primarily Republican organizations from local to state levels to get involved somehow. And we're going to continue to do that. And of course, with your inquiry, uh, boy, I'll tell you, what a piece of ammunition that is. I'll tell you what I'm hearing. And by the way, our uh, <laughs> fellow in Saipan just uh, texted me again saying it's 9.15 a.m. in Saipan. <laughs> There's my coffee, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and listen, my, my friend in Saipan there, excuse me, if you have anybody in your country, oh, boy, am I in trouble. Look, folks. My wife <laughs> me. I'm in trouble. Ah, boy. <laughs> so anyway... <laughs> Uh, anyway, if you have people in your country who are going through difficult times like this, get in touch with us. And why am I asking you to get in touch with us? Because I'm going to let the Canadian people know why we're, in, we're doing this, because I've got something in writing that I think will really, really please them and make some people understand that there is a reason why we're involved. Yeah. Ken, uh, so, so, so you're going down the road where you're going to, I think, is fabulous, educate people. And I think more so what you've done is empower people. Absolutely. Uh, uh, empower them. Now, let's just say, for example, there's a country, let's call it the United States, all right? And there are people who uh, uh, say, look, we'd like to get involved. We'd like to organize. How do we do it? Can we refer them to you? Absolutely. And I'll refer them on to the right people within the organization. I, I, I won't be the point of contact to do that because, frankly, I'm spending 12 hours, 14 hours a day writing on this report with my other three commissioners, but I could certainly hook them up and, and that would be a good uh, place to start. Ken, do you have the names of the other three commissioners if you're allowed to, to release them? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to here. Where are we here? Uh, yeah, it's uh, Bernard, Dr. Bernard Massey. He's a, um, a microbiologist. Uh, there's um, Heather de Gregorio. She's a lawyer from Calgary. And by the way, the people are all uh, the four commissioners from different parts of the country. And then um, then there's um, Janice uh, Kikowin, and she's a uh, educator from Ontario. So you have somebody from Sherbrooke, Quebec, which is just outside Montreal. You have someone from uh, uh, Ontario outside of Toronto. You have me who's in central Canada and Manitoba, and then you have a, a lawyer from Calgary. So they're distributed geographically. We have different expertise and different experience. And um, I'll tell you what, <laughs> you've never met a better group of folks to work with. You know, we clicked and um, we had a meeting yesterday. We have a weekly Zoom meeting with them just to go through where we're at. And, um, you know, we miss each other. <laughs> yeah. I, it, <laughs> yeah, I understand. You know, when I was in the military and the police department, I we left and I, I, I miss them. Ken, um, the uh, obviously, boy, I tell you, the people you have are talented and committed and dedicated. And uh, and I'm believing I'm believing that it took a lot. And I mean this literally a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer for God's guidance. I mean, I, this is this to me, as you're talking, is so remarkable that, that you've got some some real good, solid people working together, clicking together. I mean, I can't say enough about the citizens of your country. I mean, there's just on a roll here uh, and, and fighting uh, on every uh, imaginable battlefield that the government is putting in their way. But. The great battlefield that they're winning on is the spiritual battlefield. Yeah. And, uh, you well, know. you know, you, you, people people sometimes need to be reminded that the United States and Canada are, we're joined, you know, we're inseparable as a people. You know, I have two sons living in the United States. My wife's sister lives there. I have two sisters living, one in New Jersey, by the way, and one in, um, in uh, just outside Philadelphia. We're Canada is the United States biggest trading partner in the world and vice versa. You know, our sisters, our brothers live in, with you. You know, we, we work together. We live together. We trade together. Canada and the United States are not all that separate. We, we're, we're two different countries, but we are forever joined together. You know, we're, we're like we're like brothers or sisters. Well, well, Ken, you know, the people of America, before the convoy, you would mention Canada and oh, here's great things. You still hear great things, but I'm saying it wasn't on our radar. Yeah. You know, our, our radar was focused on the Mexican border, on the, the, the problems we're facing in Europe and on and on and on. But when the Freedom Convoy took place and when we saw with our own eyes the viciousness of the police. And look, I come from a military police family. I will always support police and, and military except when they clearly use excessive force on nonviolent people and break the law. And we're not done with that police force up there yet, meaning that we have a report we still have to put together uh, uh, and get to our congressional representatives and the International Association of Police Chiefs. Will they do anything? I don't know, but you know what's gonna happen? We're heightening awareness that there's a problem, all right? And here's my thought on that regarding the police. When you look at the actions of the Chinese Communist Party police in China, in Beijing. Remember Hong Kong? I mean, when you look at the, the excessive force that was used on peaceful protesters, well, and what we saw in Canada was outrageous. I mean, we've had problems here in America, all right? Uh, we, in fact, our police uh, uh, were once very tough until the woke agenda came, but all that is changing. All that's going to change. Back to the way it should be, law and order against criminals, not law-abiding citizens. Yeah. But uh, when I hear, heard some police chiefs allegedly say we're going to get the people we know who you are and and i mean that was like the mafia threatening people and so the cop in the street in canada i don't blame the patrol officers uh, uh look you got a lot of great cops good public servants in canada but these uh, commanders and 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 these individuals who you know uh, believe well we've got the protection of justin trudeau well justin trudeau is not going to protect you when the ship sinks you see yeah. And, 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 you know, there's an old saying in police work. You've heard of the blue wall of silence, Ken? You know what that is, you know? Yep. Well, you see something go wrong. You know something's corrupt or unethical. Got to keep your mouth shut. But here's what happens. And I've said this to, to law enforcement officers uh, here in the United States, that the, that the blue wall of silence uh, certainly needs to be addressed. 
Ken, uh, give me some response. I just got to notice the battery's low. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> forgot to plug it in. You go right ahead. Take over there, buddy. I'll be right back. <laughs> Oh, hold on, folks. Hold on, Ken. I pushed the wrong button. Here we go. All right, Ken. <laughs> you know, we talk about the similarities, and you talk about police, and we talked about the truckers and what happened in Ottawa. Well, you know, similar to what happened in the United States a short time ago, that area in front of the Parliament buildings is probably the most security cameraed area in Canada. My guess, and this is just a guess, although we did have one... Um, uh, uh, at least one, perhaps two or three witnesses testify about it. There is thousands and tens of thousands of hours of surveillance cameras, a uh, film of what happened with the truckers on Wellington Avenue in front of the parliament buildings. And yet the government tried to smear those truckers with one or two pictures that they just so happened to have uh, uh, captured. And so similar to yourselves, one of the things that I would like to see is the federal government in Canada release the videos, release the tens of thousands of hours of videos that we know you have of every moment that happened on Wellington Street and let the Canadian people make a decision as to what happened there. You know, it's amazing uh, that um, they can have all the video footage they want, but the people have the unedited <laughs> version. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's the problem. We have some of the unedited versions here. You know, yeah. but, uh, Ken, I got to tell you, I'm proud of you and your family and your fellow commissioners and all the citizens that are helping you. And and I've said this over and over again, and this is important, folks, for you to know, the U.S. government is not going to come to save you. You will save yourselves. You That's will. right. What we can do is encourage you. Uh, what we can do is inform our citizens and like we're doing informing our leaders that we, the United States of America, need to defend the freedoms and rights of the Canadian people. Because if Canada goes down, folks, guess who's next? We haven't learned, Ken. We haven't learned from Germany and Hitler. We haven't learned from Japan in the 20s and 30s. Uh, we're not learning with Ukraine. I, and that's another whole story. I don't even know why yeah, we're yeah. involved in that mess. But when <laughs> Canada, Good question. Oh, yeah. When it comes to Canada, we need to keep our eyes and ears open. Ken, any final thoughts before we move on? You know, folks, I, I couldn't agree with Lieutenant Rogers more. Do, you are the white knight. You can't wait for the white knight to come charging down the road to save you. They, they're not coming. You're the white knight. You have to charge out and save yourselves and your children and your grandchildren and your mothers and your fathers. It's up to us, folks. It's up to us. Well, Ken, thanks so much. And listen, I know Canada Day is coming up, so <laughs> we'll see you again. And I wish you the best, but we'll see you, you real soon. We'll be talking to you. And Ken, we'll be keeping you updated on what we're doing here. And thank thank you. you. Come on in again. Will you come on again? Oh, absolutely. It was a pleasure. It always is. Thank you. Make sure the plugs are in and we're not going to vote. <laughs> thanks, Ken. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. What do you think of that, folks? You talk about another hero. I love these heroes. I call them heroes. They are. They are, folks. What, 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 what more is there to say? Now, before I get to our next guest, Joe Connor, who has a riveting story, so don't go anywhere. And this guy went through hell and high water, and he's still fighting. He is still fighting for the uh, uh, for transparency, for justice, and, and, and for the American people, as well as people worldwide. All right, so here's what I want to do. The SOS situation. Uh, the letters the letters are coming in. We need a lot more, folks. I'm going to be perfectly frank with you. We need a lot more. And I'm confident they'll come in. Now, one thing, another thing we found out, other than some media and reporters watching this broadcast, is that we do have reason to believe that uh, those in the Canadian government, uh, maybe some here in America, who are opposed to uh, the idea that we would fight for freedom and liberty uh, joined together, Canadians, Americans, and North America, uh, they're watching this broadcast, and what they're looking for, me, to say the numbers with regard to SOS letters. I'm not going to give any more numbers out, folks. Because I'm also finding out uh, through some of our sources that there is concern from certain officials in Canada of a public embarrassment, uh, meaning that if we do get the amount of letters we're looking for, uh, 100,000 plus, uh, it'll be not a national embarrassment. It'll be an international embarrassment uh, for Trudeau and his government. Uh, so please keep those letters coming in. Uh, it's important we receive them. And... Uh, all I can say is keep up the good work. Now, I'm going to answer this question. I get it over and over again from Americans, Canadians, and others. 
Why are you, meaning Campaign for America, so intense on uh, defending and fighting for the freedom and rights of the American people uh, when we have our own problems here? Well, the fact of the matter is, folks, is that we are fighting for the American people and we're fighting for the American people just like others who came through this road and this door long ago. I'm going to read something to you and this will answer the question, kind of sum it up why we're deeply involved in this fight. And here's what is part of a report I'm releasing next week. And you're all going to get it. We're going to put it on one of our websites. We're going to announce it. In fact, I'm going to actually invite the the media to uh, look at the whole report. But here is part of the report. And by the way, the report is actually a response to your Broadcasting Act. Okay, but this is part of it. Answers the question, why are we that involved? It is important to know that during the late 1940s, President Harry S. Truman issued what is known as the Truman Doctrine a commitment that the United States would do whatever was necessary both to prevent the spread of communism around the world. Every president since the Truman Doctrine was created committed America to fight communism and its political influence worldwide until its total defeat, which came under the presidency of Ronald Reagan when his policies defeated Soviet communism. But little did we know right now, folks, in this century, little did we know that the defeat of Soviet communism was not the last word we would hear from the Communist Party. And little did we know that the influence of the Communist Party would plant a strong root close to home, namely Canada. So the answer is this, folks. Under the Truman Doctrine of 1940, the United States of America, be it by its government or by the people, the United States of America would, without any doubt, have to get involved within the framework of the law to actually fight the Communist Party. So we feel and see and, 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 and understand that the Communist Party influence in Canada is absolutely uh, uh, creeping closer and closer to the border of the United States. So that is why we're involved. We have a duty and obligation to the Canadian people. And there'll be more on this, more on this as we uh, move on further. And we're going to release this report next week. All right, folks. So now Joe Connor, uh, I interviewed him earlier in the week. Uh, great guy. Uh, absolutely has a great um, uh, uh, but very shocking and intense story. So let's get right to the interview. Folks. Who's out there on the front lines, like many are uh, looking to secure freedom, liberty, individual rights. And here he is, Joe Connor. Joe, welcome to our broadcast. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you coming on. So, Joe, uh, I did familiarize our audience a little bit about you uh, and what you're doing, but uh, would you be kind enough to share uh, with the people who you are, where you're from, and and exactly uh, the the great role, and it is a great role, that you're playing in securing our freedoms, our liberties, uh, our individual rights, and and bringing truth uh, and incredible information to the people? Sure. Look, I, I thank you for that. I, you know, I think we all have a role to play and we got it. We all got Delta hand and, you know, we got to do the best that we have with what we got. So, um, you know, when I was nine years old, my father was murdered by uh, terrorists at Francis Tavern in New York. Uh, he was 33 years old, um, first generation American living the American dream and was uh, murdered when a uh, Puerto Rican separatist group, the FALN, who were Cuban sponsored and financed. Uh, walked a bomb into Francis Tavern where he was having lunch with clients. He worked for J.P. Morgan Bank, um, went to college at night to Fairleigh Dickinson and um, really was made something of himself. Um, but this group uh, walked, went into Francis. And for those of you who are familiar with the city or for Francis, it's the oldest building still in New York. It's where the Sons of Liberty met. It's where George Washington bade farewell to his officers after the Revolutionary War. Uh, so it was really integral in the um, in American liberty, and it was chosen as a target um, for that precise reason. And uh, he, my dad happened to be having lunch with clients when um, the bomb was detonated. Uh, four people were murdered, 60 were wounded in really unspeakable manners. I hate even to think about it. And uh, it was January 24th, 1975. Uh, it would have, we were going to be celebrating my ninth birthday that night. I was born January 20th and my brother, 
I was nine years old. My brother was 11 years old. He was born January 13th. And my Irish born mom was making a lasagna, believe it or not. She's pretty good at it. And um, we were going to be celebrating our birthdays that night. And uh, my, my dad never came home. Um, uh, Joe, so Joe uh, for one minute, I'm going to share something with you. Very interesting. I want you to continue. Uh, sure. This uh, program we now are now uh, broadcasting. Uh, our producer pushed the live button. <laughs> so we're, we're live. I'm seeing some stuff on the side there, but I wasn't, you know, I don't have my glasses on, so I can't, I couldn't well, read it. You're, watching, so. you're getting a treat because I'm interviewing Joe Connor right now, and then we were going to record it. And we're going to, we're actually, we'll replay this also on uh, uh, in uh, July, Joe, okay? Uh, I just okay. want you to know, I got a kick out. I'm watching these numbers. I'm saying, boy, they're growing, but uh, fascinating right. story. So instead of stopping the broadcast, we're going to go on with it, okay? Let's so go. You'll, you'll be on twice. We're on now. And then <laughs> no, you don't want to see me twice, believe me. No, uh, no, but please continue. Uh, I just had to let you know. I'm watching these numbers. I'm saying, my goodness, are we live? We are. All right. <laughs> cool. All right, let's do it. Let's so, go. um, yeah, so, yeah, he was, he was murdered. He didn't come home that night. And, um, you know, my mom was from Ireland. She was here really on her own. Aside from my father's mother, my father was an only child. And uh, so Grandma Connor and my mom sort of raised my brother and me. And, uh, you know, we went to college and my brother and my mom went back to school, got her college degree and graduated from uh, William Patterson in New Jersey the same day my brother graduated from Boston College. So, you know, we, we really did the best to move on and do the best we could without ever forgetting my dad. Um, and that is until uh, 1999 and uh, Hillary Clinton was gonna be running for Senator from New York. And she really had no connection to New York. She was a carpet bagger. And uh, there was a, we had actually heard a few months before that maybe a year that the Clintons were considering offering executive clemency to the FALN terrorists um, who killed my dad. They were sentenced up to 70 years in prison. Some tried to escape from prison. They wouldn't um, testify at their own trials. They threatened to kill the judge at sentencing. Uh, they were a bad, bad lot, and they were put away for essentially life in Chicago. Uh, however, they were never specifically convicted of the Francis bombing because they were convicted of so many other um, crimes, including seditious conspiracy, which has come back now. People incredibly are comparing, you know, sworn terrorists to um, protesters these days. But in any event, they were um, they were sentenced to these long prison terms but never convicted of the Francis bombing. So when Hillary was running, uh, the Clintons came up with this story that they were nonviolent terrorists and, uh, and offered them executive clemency in August, 1999. Uh, out of the 16, uh, none of them accepted the clemency, believe it or not, they, they refused it because it, it had some um, stipulations to it. They had to reject violence as a means of political gain and they had to disassociate them disassociate themselves with other felons such as each other. One of them, Oscar, Lo uh, fi finally, excuse me, finally a month later on September 10th, 1999, they did accept the clemency after being allowed to have conference calls between prisons and, and accept this. And Eric Holder was the architect under Bill Clinton for these clemencies. And I can get into that a little bit more later. But um, one, Oscar Lopez refused the clemency and stayed in prison. And it wasn't until um, 2011 when I went to his parole hearing in, the, in Terre Haute, Indiana, at the prison there. Um, we kept him in, and he disclosed that he refused the clemency because Carlos Torres, one of the other leaders of the FALN, wasn't offered uh, clemency. So Oscar would go down with the ship. So Oscar stayed in prison until um, Obama's last day in office in 2017 when Obama gave Oscar Lopez, the second clemency for the same terrorist crimes. And uh, he ended up walking out of prison um, shortly after that. And uh, was they tried to name him a freedom hero of the Puerto Rican Day Parade in New York in 2017. We had that stopped. Um, the sponsors like Coca-Cola and Goya Foods and um, New York Yankees pulled their sponsorship of the parade um, until Lopez wasn't given that honor, but he did march in the parade. So. So th my father's life was used for political means. And, and on the other hand, just uh, a, a parallel incident was on, I, I mentioned that on September 10th, 1999, these terrorists walked out of jail. I started writing a book about it that night. And uh, in, in September 10th, 2001, I'm sorry. 
um, they, they walked out of jail. And um, sorry, Sept September 10th, 1999, they, they, went, they walked out of jail. Two years later on September 10th, um, 2001, I wanted to start writing about it. And I was taking the train, train home from work. I work in New York. And I brought my laptop and I avoided seeing my cousin, Steve, uh, because he always had beers and he was going to make me have a few on the train. And um, I had a doctor's appointment that night. So I started writing a book about my dad and the clemencies that were offered uh, two years earlier. And uh, the next day, Steve was murdered on 9-11 um, as I just commuted through the World Trade Center and saw the planes hit. Um, Steve was my father's godson. And uh, that night I drove his car. I got home and drove his car home from the Radburn train station in Fairlawn, New Jersey, uh, which is the same train station that my dad had parked his car in a generation before. So our families were hit twice uh, by terrorism. And, um, you know, the stark contrast between we went to war over the terrorists that attacked Steve and murdered him. And in the case of my father, um, his terrorists were, re were released and it was all for politics. And so that's been a focus of my life for quite some time um, is to uh, bring justice to my dad. Um, one of the other terrorists, a guy by the name of William Morales, um, blew himself up on what would, would, would have been my dad's 37th birthday, July 12th, 1978. Um, he blew himself up while building a bomb in his Queens bomb factory. He blew off nine of his fingers, part of his face. Somehow he, um, he was sent to 89 years um, New York State, 10 years federal and escaped from prison, believe it or not, and has been a guest of Cuba um, since the mid 80s. And uh, so one of my, the other goals is to uh, bring Morales back and Joanne Chesimard and other fugitives from Cuba to face uh, the prison Joe, terms in the U.S. Joe, I remember Joanne Chesimard. In fact, I was traveling down the turnpike the day that the uh, uh, she killed Warner Forster, I believe. was Warner Forster. It was 50 yeah. years ago, just the other day. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I, no one can imagine how you and your family feel or even felt at that time to know that the people who killed uh, your, your father and, and, and your other relative are, are just out. Uh, yeah. But uh, listen, God bless you for not giving up the fight to, to get these, uh, uh, these, these animals to return to the United States. So, 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 so moving forward now, you, you said you're committing yourself and obviously on honor of your father and family members and others. Uh, what are you doing now with regard to that fight? Well, several things. One is um, I, I wrote a book um, called Shattered Lives about my dad. And that, that book that I started the night before 9-11 uh, sort of changed after 9-11. Uh, it, it took a long time to get it done. Um, I met a guy named Jeff Ingber, who's a professional writer. We did a nice job putting this book together. We also have a movie that uh, we premiered in New Jersey a couple of months ago, and it's in final edits now. We hope to get it into uh, the Daily Wire or another um, online um, service. Um, it's pretty powerful. It discusses the um, FALN, discusses my dad, what, it did, what terrorism does to a family a 9-11 um, trip to Guantanamo Bay, which I went to in 2016 as a 9-11 family member, and really um, brings brings up the injustices when terrorism um, is used by, um, by politics, by politicians for their betterment or their perceived betterment. I mean, um, you know, I testified at Eric Holder's Senate confirmation hearing when he was going to become attorney general in 2009. And at the time I said, you know, anyone that would would be part of the release of t murderers, terrorists for political gain, would do anything. And I think that we're seeing now that the uh, DOJ has done just that. Um, that is a holdover, I think, from the older days where um, the justice is only for those who are in the power. And, uh, you know, I saw it, you know, testifying in front of the Senate and having the senator sort of literally because they're up high look down on me and the other yeah. um, family members you know like like they're um gods on mount olympus yeah you, you know Joe, and the rest of us are just sort of there it's interesting sad, you bring sad, up the, sad sacks yeah that visual that they're high above and they're looking down 
Uh, I tend to believe these days, and you know, I'm sorry to say this, that uh, our governments have become terrorist. I really believe government officials have become terrorists, <laughs> by, and not all of them. Uh, we've got a lot of good representatives in Congress. I'm sure the uh, parliament in Canada, where those, those, those people up there are, are fighting a, a tremendous fight for freedom. Uh, yeah. But when government becomes a terror to the people, well, uh, then the people have to stand up and take action. And I always say that within the framework of the law. Uh, yeah, we have a constitution, we have a, they have a Bill of Rights in Canada. And, and what you're doing is within the framework of the law. What you're doing is effectively, and uh, I, I would say this, that, you know, your efforts are not in vain. Apparently, you're having imp- you're on this broadcast, which which I'm, thank- well, I'm thanking God I have you on. So they're not <laughs> Well, well, thank you. And, you know, we did get a, uh, a bill uh, put forward in front of the Senate um, with, uh, with Rubio and Menendez uh, at the end of last year. And actually, I found out yesterday that the House is going to be putting a similar bill across. And the, the bill was called the uh, Trooper Warner Forster Frank Connor Justice Act. And that would be to, uh, to call for the return of these terrorists from Cuba. So, look, our country is... Is amazing when it, when someone like me who really had no background in anything um, is able to testify in front of the Senate a couple of times and and really w- wage this one man show and you know I do have allies and friends and and that but a lot of it is is you know a lot of it is me is driven by me I'll, you know my cousin Gene has been great my mom has been great my brother's been involved sometimes but we've you know it's been just family and friends that have. Um, Try to try to show justice, and the, the the truth is that if they could do this to us, they could do it to anybody. Like you know, we're we're just a regular family, and uh, you know, we, people remain silent when things go wrong. And you know, a, a good and, and and we didn't. A good example of that is when um, when a group of us went to Terre Haute to face Oscar Lopez at his parole hearing, and uh, you know, we show up at this prison in Terre Haute, Indiana. And it was, it looked like something out of the Shawshank Redemption. It was terrifying looking, right? So, so we go in and one of the guards says, well, you guys know what to do. And like, how could we possibly know what to do? Like you tell us, what do you do when, when, when family members come as witnesses at a parole hearing, a federal parole hearing? And he's like, oh, no one's ever come before. They just mail it in. And we were like, well, we ain't mailing it in. Like that, that's not going to happen and it'll never happen. So, you know, my, my dad deserved a lot better than he got. My cousin Steve, who was murdered on 9-11, although we went to war um, on, over his murder, he deserves better than what he's getting. Because right now, I was at a, a meeting last week of 9-11 family members and the prosecution. Now they're talking about a, pre, a plea bargain um, with these um, five high-value de, high detainees like uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Bin Atash and Ali and these, and these guys who admitted murder. And now they're talking about a plea bargain uh, that would put them probably in a U.S. prison out of Guantanamo Bay. And, uh, and they don't want to go to a maximum security prison because they know what it's like for like Zacharias Masawi, who was a 20th hijacker who's sitting in a hole in Florence, Colorado with the, with the Unabomber and, uh, and um, some of the other um, terrorists. So, um, you know, w- w- we need to fight back. And like I said before, you know, all of us has something. You know, none of us gets out of this life alive, and we all have a uh, a cause that we can use. And um, you know, in, in my case, it was very clear as to what I can do for justice. And my dad deserves deserves everything I got. Joe, yeah, this uh, this uh, the, you said the bill was passed already. No, it was put forward before the uh, the Senate last year, and then it was, uh, you know. I, I hear you. I can see. Look at. The reason why I ask, I could see the frustration on your yeah, face. Yeah, it sucks, uh, right? There's an election coming up, or unless you got a $20,000 yeah. donation. Uh, uh, and look, I don't like to call people names, but these guys are, are really clowns. I mean, I, I'm, well, they, I'm, they, I'm, look, I'm, if they were in the private they, sector, they would last about 10 seconds. I mean, honestly, you can't do the BS that they that they put people through without coming through. All right, and, so, so but the fact is, I have to deal with them. I have to work with them. Well, here's why I ask you that question, all right? Uh, I've learned something by being elected to office myself and and by being in the political circles, 
Uh, I've learned about the corruption. I've learned about what they're what, not all of them. All right. I'm going to qualify that. There are good people yeah. who are in office that that that's that really, really work hard. But unfortunately, they're outnumbered by individuals who are more concerned about uh, their political survival than the survival sure. of guys like you, me and others. But saying that I've learned that we have a lot of power. The people have a lot of power. And uh, what I've also learned is by now reaching and I shared with uh, this fact with you earlier, uh, reaching 10,000 letters within uh, maybe 10 days from the Canadians and more coming thousands a day. Uh, we plan to do something with them. And that's a voice. That's a voice. It and I bring that up for this reason. If we can do something similar like that for you uh, on that bill, I'm willing to have Campaign for America uh, do that. Uh, uh, make an appeal to people uh, all over this country uh, and other countries to send us a letter. Uh, and it don't have to be a big letter. It just has to be we support, you know, uh, that yeah. bill. I mean, would that help? I have a template for it. Yes, it would. Absolutely. When we did, when we premiered the movie, um, we sent a uh, that a note to every everyone who was there. It was you know, a couple hundred people. And, uh, and we had a template to send to your congressman and your senator um, requesting that this bill be passed and that these terrorists be returned that Joe and Chesimar be brought back, that William Morales be brought back, that Charlie Hill, that Victor Garena, that all these uh, terrorists be brought back from Cuba. So yes, that would be that would be incredibly helpful. Well, here's, that, here's, what, here's, sorry. Joe, Joe, here's what, here's what I want to do, okay? Uh, I want to replicate what we're doing uh, in uh, assisting the Canadian people. I want to replicate the methodology that we use. We didn't use a template. We asked them just simply to write something. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, these politicians, they receive templates from everybody. And, 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 and believe me, I don't think they pay attention. But I, here's what they pay attention to. They'll pay attention to a, a handwritten note, but more so they'll pay attention to media coverage. Uh, I want to be able to bring a minimum of 100,000 letters from Canada, and I'm hoping it's more, uh, to the uh, doorstep of uh, a congressional representative or right to the U.S. Congress. I really want to go to Washington. I don't know if I could get close to the Capitol these days. But either way, we want to make... You might, but you might not get home. Well, we want to make a media event out of this because that's what they pay attention to. I want to know... In fact, we're even thinking of bringing the letters and putting them in front of the Canadian embassy or consulate, right? Uh, so my point is, when, and I say this because when you work within the framework of the law, the law's on our side, we could do those things legally. But I've learned through being on the media, being in politics... Politicians are not going to pay attention until such time the media is going to get a hold of it and they're going to think of two things. One, they're going to get involved for the photo op or two, uh, they're going to get involved to save their own hides. So yeah. my point is this. What, what I'll do is uh, after the uh, broadcast, uh, I'm going to call you. All right. Let's talk about this. And uh, I want to be able to do whatever we could to, to help you. You've already got the Thank bill you. in the hopper. It's already there. Uh, there's, it, it, we, the Republicans, we control the United States Congress, for goodness sakes. Uh, and, and there's no reason why we can't move on. And I believe, I want to believe there are some Democrats who are conservatives uh, and, and moderates who will support a bill. That's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, I, I know that Chris Smith's office is, is joined in, and we have um, Salazar. Chris Smith's a great is, guy, great guy. I got contacted. It was coincidental. Just yesterday, his office contacted me. Um, we have Salazar's office in um, in Florida. Uh, Rubio was involved, and you know, and Menendez. What you want is at least he's a uh, he's good on Cuba. So, um, you know, this is something that's really important. Uh, in, and bipartisanism, too, in that respect is uh, yes, is helpful. Yes. Ironically, I'm going to be meeting with Chris Smith, hopefully in the next uh, month or two. Uh, we've been talking about certain issues, uh, particularly he's on the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, and I want to be able to sit down and talk to him about Canada. Uh, uh, but at the same time, now I want to be able to talk to him about your cause, too. Look, we're, you know, I've always said this, Joe. Unfortunately, uh, we are, we are distracted in this country with a lot of issues, the southern border, the Ukraine war. Uh, we're distracted with issues that uh, are not as important to us as yours, not as important to us as what's happening on our northern border. Uh, so we at Campaign for America, uh, and there are other organizations like us, I'm sure, need to keep our eyes on the ball of those things that really count. 
And this counts. This is about justice. This is about sending a signal to terrorists and others that you will pay a price uh, for your, uh, your for the murders and the, the, the ill deeds that you've uh, brought upon the American people. That's exactly right. And and for the longest time, we said things like, you know, we don't we don't negotiate with with terrorists, and uh, and now we're capitulating to terrorists, and yeah. um, it's yeah. it, it, it's so ass backwards, and um, you know, it's something. And I, I understand what you're saying. Look, sometimes they throw so much crap against the wall that you know you can't even keep up with it. And and I leave that you know a lot of the other things I leave to other people who have that expertise. I have this expertise, and I have, I'm 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 pretty well versed in most of the issues that are going on right now, but I generally write and speak about what I know, and I speak about what I can control, and um, and and you know I don't. I've learned that too many people give you too much BS, and unless I'm holding it myself, you know I'm, um, you know it's I, I can't I can't trust that it's it's real. So I do I really do appreciate that. We also have the New Jersey State Police behind us, um, Colonel. Um, Cap Kavanaugh, right? Um, yeah. um, so you know we have a we have a good group of people who've been supporting this um, effort, and I think when the movie finally gets uh, released, um, that may add some traction to it as well. Well, maybe even before that. Uh, I hope so. By the grace of God, you know, I'm a, a very strong believer in prayer and the power of prayer, and I believe that. You know, God has put us here, here in, in this organization, in a position uh, to bring a lot of uh, help to people uh, like yourself and others who are seeing their freedoms, their justice, their liberties, their individual rights uh, get slowly eroded as a result of who, though? A result of who? Of those that you described earlier that think they could sit on a chair above us and look down upon us. Well, they, that, that, that's not flying anymore because of the progress we've made, when I say we, the American people, as you, you've seen, maybe we've made in this country. But at the same time, I don't want people in my party to give you lip service, you see? Uh, I'll call them out as I call Democrats out. And I'm, I'm a little disturbed. Uh, I'm gonna say I'm a lot disturbed over the fact that this bill is in the hopper. We have congressional representatives uh, who are Republicans who know about it. And as you said, they're just kind of giving a pass to terrorists. That's what they're doing. They'll, they'll let it die on the vine until it until it means something to them politically. And, well, and we're gonna put we're gonna put water on the on the roots of where that vine is. And <laughs> let it grow. How is that, buddy? All right. So look, well, that sounds here. right, man. Look, you know, I, I don't know. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. No, I was gonna say, like, you know, the other thing I didn't mention was the book. You know, one of the, the first book that I wrote with a guy named with Mike Duncan, who I went to college with, was called The New Founder. I have a copy of it here. Yeah, let's and see. It. This, Put it up there. Put it up there. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can see this, but is it backwards? Anyway, yeah, it is. Um and yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> um, Joe, can you get it on Amazon or uh... <laughs> Yeah, you can. And in, in the book it brings the founders the American founders back to life in the uh, 20th century America. It was written during the Obama administration. And um, so many of the, the issues that we're, we're facing now and faced back, you know, seven or eight years ago, whatever it was, 10 years ago, um, the founders talked about. And the the answers to our issues are found in the Constitution. And, uh, you know, we, we turn it into a story where George Washington comes back and they run him for president of the United States. It becomes a little bit funny and quirky in certain areas. But the story is, uh, the message is very clear about um, what we need to do as a country, and that is to return to our founding principles. And Absolutely. and and one of, one of the main points of the book, and John Adams really discussed it a lot, was that, you know, if we don't have a, a Judeo-Christian values in this country, it just doesn't work. And uh, and I think that's what we're seeing now is that there is no value. There, um, the values are being taken from people. They don't understand the Constitution. They don't understand. Uh, what it means to worship God, uh, that there's a greater, if they're, if they give no power to God, then they give the power to the government. And, yeah. and that's what we're seeing. And the, the founders knew all that. Well, uh, well Joe, and it's just I, clear I would, I would suggest ever. this, that, yeah, they're, 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 they're maybe not taking it from us, but we are surrendering, you see, uh, because we, our we people become have, lethargic and yeah. Yeah. yeah we, I'll speak uh, at least for this country. Uh, a lot of American people, are not that educated when it comes to our founding fathers, our documents, uh, not their fault, the schools. Well, it's their fault. Yep. It's our fault. Look, a man once said to me, you're living in a republic where you could go and vote 
If you don't vote, don't be surprised when they take your rights away. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to get people out and involved and engaged like you are. But here's what we're going to do. Oh, by the way, uh, before we go, any last words? And then I want to wrap it up with you. Well, any last words? It sounds kind of ominous, but but I think... <laughs> okay. I think anyway, <laughs> any last words for this segment? <laughs> I, 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 think, guy. <laughs> I, I think I think honestly... Um, you know, it's funny you talk about the schools too. And, you know, my, my wife's a teacher and, and they, you know, and I think in her world, she does everything she can. I think most teachers actually do, do, do everything they can to, to give a clear education to this, to the kids. Um, but when your kids go to school, it's not enough that they're getting all A's and whatever. You need to look at what actually they're learning. Um, and I, you know, so, so the grades are only part of it. Um, um, and, uh, as far as everything else goes, I'm, um, you know, I think I think we all need to step up. Um, you know, unfortunately, I have these terrible opportunities to step up, and but I have people like you that have given my dad voice, and you know, Fox did for a long time. Newsmax has. I write, write for Town Hall and Breitbart, and you know, these outlets have given uh, given us uh, voice to people with no voice, and we all have that. We all have something in our lives that we can cling to and say, "Hey, look, we can make the world a little bit better, or make our country a little bit better." if I can get something changed. And um, we all we all owe it to each other to do that. Well said, Joe. Well, before we go, folks, uh, well, we weren't supposed to be live, right, Joe? But uh, we are That's live. true. We gotta, I gotta, <laughs> sorry, I got a couple of websites, too, if anyone wants to hear. Oh, yeah, go ahead. We What's win, the website? Go ahead. We, Wewinamerica.com. Wewinamerica.com. And then we have shatteredlivesmovie.com. And uh, the new founders, that's the book.net. So, oh, those are terrific. So, so if you're watching now, you're watching by accident, maybe not, maybe some divine interventions here to get some money. <laughs> That's gonna, true. We're going to help the cause. But uh, Joe, uh, it's a pleasure having you. This will be aired officially, uh, I believe uh, July 6th is our first Thursday night. It'll be the first Thursday oh, night wow. in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, July. And, right about uh, Independence Day. That's perfect. Yeah, and, and people had a very special. I, I see some of the comments. Uh, tell your producer to do this again. We enjoy the broadcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> folks, uh, again, I want to uh, uh, thank you all for tuning in. That are on now. These are this broadcast is probably going to disappear uh, off of uh, our platforms in about uh, twenty minutes after Joe and I uh, uh, say we'll see you later. I never say goodbye. I always say I'll see you later. But uh, cool. look out for it uh, uh, on the in the first Thursday of July. Joe, it, it was a treat. It was a treat. Oh, it's like good. Thank you. Listen, it's we're going to help you. Really I'm going to give you it. about 15, 20 minutes to call you on the phone, right. and uh, uh, I'm going to need information. We're going to help you. Okay. We're gonna All right, Steve. I've, uh, that's All right, awesome. Now. Thank hey, you thanks so much. a lot, Joe. Thanks. Thanks. All right, folks. So as you can see, we, Joe and I recorded that broadcast. I think about a month ago already. We had planned to air it July sixth. Uh, but we had some programming changes and we had him on tonight. But nevertheless, I'm going to call him after this broadcast. Now, folks, before I, I leave you tonight, uh, we've been on the go all week, starting six in the morning, not home. I, I got in about 20 minutes, a half hour before the broadcast. And uh, believe it or not, we're going to be on our way out in about 20 minutes. Uh, we've been on the go. Uh, it's election time here in America. The elections are over, at least uh, the primaries are. But we got a lot of work we're doing. But we are not going to give up on Canada. We're not going to give up on people like Joe. Uh, the uh, job here at Campaign for America has expanded to uh, degrees that I have never, never would have imagined. Uh, and uh, the work is just uh, a lot of work. Now, we're not perfect. We've got uh, mistakes we made, as you saw tonight. Who didn't pull a plug in? All of the people working here, there's only about a half a dozen, uh, are volunteers. Nobody gets paid. Nobody gets paid. I don't get paid. Nobody gets paid. We all do this for the cause. And that's what I love about what we're doing. But as you know, I am very reluctant and have been very reluctant to ask you for support. Uh, but we've come to that point, folks, where we're going to have to get some new equipment. Uh, we've come to that point where our expenditures with regard to what we're doing uh, are increasing as a result of price increases. I mean, you, 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 you heard the story, I'm sure, from a million people in different organizations. I just have to ask you to evaluate what you've seen, what you see we're doing, and uh, ask you to consider 
uh, sending us a contribution. Now, there's a little Q bar up there. I, look, and I'm not a, a, a QR code guy, but I understand you put your camera there and click it. Uh, it'll take you right to where you can make a donation, I believe, on PayPal. We're using PayPal again because we have found that they have agreed uh, to change their policies back to uh, giving people the, uh, let's put it this way, uh, the, the opportunity not to see their uh, rights hindered, no rights of free speech. So we're satisfied with that. But if you'd like, go to www.thepatriotnest.com. You see it in the little blue bar below. Uh, you go there, you'll see a donate button uh, for a MasterCard, Visa, et cetera. And you'll see a donate button on the top that'll take you to PayPal. Look, folks, even if it was a dollar or two, I'm not kidding. With the number of people who listen to us and watch us faithfully every week, uh, I, I want to be able to say next week, we don't have to ask for any more money this year. Why? Because we're financed. We get to a certain level. I'm going to say that to you because you need to do these things first before you contribute to us. You need to take care of your family. Make sure you can provide for your children. Pay for your taxes, your mortgage. Take care of all your personal needs first. And then if you have a few extra dollars here or there, I'm going to ask you to make a contribution to us. Uh, I find it uh, disheartening at times uh, that broadcast uh, similar to ours, all right, uh, that we, we have to come on the air and ask for your support because, uh, you know what, uh, political people aren't going to support us and we don't want their support. But what's disheartening is that people are willing to, to give these politicians thousands of dollars. I mean, I'm sure you get them in the mail, right? $500 for a gold sponsor, 1000 for a silver platinum sponsor. People are giving it. People are paying a lot of money to go to these uh, political events. And believe me, I've gone to them. I don't pay to go. I go to speak if I'm in support of a candidate. Or maybe I'll go to meet people if I'm invited, but I'm not going to finance any more political operations. I did it my whole life. I'm not going to do it anymore because that investment, as far as I'm concerned, unless a political person shows me that they mean what they say and keep their promises, they're not going to get a dime from me. I'd rather give, and we do give to other organizations that need help when we have enough uh, financial support. So saying that, that's it, folks. I'm laying out to you that the, the Bible says you receive not because you ask not. And believe me, people who know me know I struggle. I struggle with asking people to uh, give us contributions. You know, when I ran for office a few times, man, I had the hardest time with my campaign manager who, who, who begged me to go out there and said, you got to ask for support. I wouldn't do it. I said, you guys do it. I'm not going to do it. Well, they did, and we won. Uh, so we won twice because we asked to be financed by the people, not by special interest. So that's where we're at, folks. There you go, the QR code. I think if you put your camera there, you take a picture, it sends you to a donate section or the patriotdesk.com. Now, we're going to be hitting the road again soon. I got to go someplace with Natasha for an hour. But before I do, I promised Joe I would call him. So I'm going to call him right after we're off the air. And that's it, folks. Now, Shadow Davis might be on the air now, but always keep him in mind uh, after you leave our broadcast because he's doing a bang up job uh, in Canada, as well as uh, a number of other Canadian citizens who have live stream broadcast. So more importantly than sending us financial support, which I hope you do, keep us in your prayers. The power of prayer is mighty. And there's no question in my mind that uh, God does answer prayers. Folks, I thank you so much. God bless you. We'll see you uh, next Thursday night here live on all these uh, social media broadcasts. And uh, you might see us over the weekend, by the way. You might see us over the weekend. God bless you. Take care. Uh, and remember the good Lord, no matter what you're going through, and I know some of you are going through tough times, he will never give up on you. Never. The Bible says, I will stick closer to you than a brother. That's his promise that he will always keep. I'm Lieutenant Stephen Rogers. Have a great night. Thank you.